Hello, and welcome to A Health Podacy. I'm your host, Alan Weil. The term cost-effective is thrown around a lot in healthcare discussions. Beyond its colloquial meaning, it refers to a structured type of analysis that can be used to consider the degree to which the benefits of a clinical intervention or a policy intervention exceed the costs. Of course, we generally prefer interventions that are cost-effective over ones that are not. There's an intersection between traditional cost-effectiveness analysis and the goal of achieving health equity. What does this intersection look like? That is the topic of today's episode of A Health Policy. I'm here with Sanjay Basu, co-founder and head of clinical at Waymark. Dr. Basu and co-authors published a paper in the August 2024 issue of Health Affairs examining how cost-effectiveness assessments can inadvertently perpetuate health disparities. We'll discuss how that might happen and what to do about it in today's episode. Dr. Basu, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So this is a complicated topic, but one that's really important. So we're going to take our time with it. Uh, I want to start with just sort of setting the stage around cost-effectiveness analysis. I gave sort of a one-sentence summary, but if you could just explain to our listeners a little more, what is a cost-effectiveness analysis and where do you see them used sometimes in healthcare? Sure. Thank you for that. Uh, Cost-effectiveness analyses are tools used in healthcare, but also broader public health policy decision-making, they help us determine which interventions provide the most health benefits per dollar spent. Typically, these analyses calculate an incremental cost-effectiveness ratio, ICER, or ICER. That measures the cost per quality-adjusted life year, or quality, gained by an intervention. Typically, that means if I run a program, let's say a diabetes prevention program that encourages people to engage in physical activity, uh, helps them eat more nutritious food, the analysis would involve studying how much my program prevents diabetes complications like blindness or dialysis and improves both the quality of life and length of life versus how much it costs. And so policymakers and healthcare organizations use these analyses to allocate their resources and decide which interventions to implement or fund. And sometimes there's sort of a threshold, right? We're willing to spend a certain amount if it saves lives or improves lives, but if it's more expensive than we can afford, maybe we just uh, have to pass on that one. Is that... So sometimes there are, uh, there are thresholds actually applied in determining whether or not to uh, pursue an intervention? Correct. Although it's been discouraged by academics over the last several years, several institutions such as health plans do still use cost-effectiveness thresholds to inform decisions on, for example, what interventions they might cover under a person's health insurance plan. Sometimes a commonly used threshold is $50,000 per quality adjusted life year. Uh, In international settings, sometimes three times the gross domestic product per person is used. Um, But these thresholds uh, can, in fact, decide and help inform decisions, even if there are several concerns around using them. Right. And so there's a whole literature out there of both empirical and uh, uh, commentary criticizing uh, approaches of cost effective analysis, particularly criticizing the use of the quality. Um, And when I say criticize, I don't mean it's all negative. I mean, it's sort of querying the positives and negatives, but certainly raising concerns about the use of those uh, concepts. Uh, Stepping beyond sort of the general challenges associated with conducting a cost-effectiveness analysis in a way that you would use the results. You focus on the relationship between these assessments and health disparities. And uh, in your paper, you you walk through three sort of mathematical, is the way I think of it, ways that if you do a traditional cost-effectiveness assessment, you could end up inadvertently uh, increasing disparities rather than closing them. So uh, 
I'm going to ask you, uh, and I know our listeners, if they really want to get into this, are going to need to read the paper, but I'm going to ask you if you could to just sort of go through these three ways in order and and give us a feel for how this can happen. Certainly. Uh, what my colleagues, uh, Athene Venkataramani and Dean Schillinger and I argue is that there are three ways that traditional cost-effectiveness methods might undervalue interventions that benefit disadvantaged groups. Uh, One way is because in cost-effectiveness analyses, we often think about competing risks and assume these competing risks will remain the same. So marginalized populations often face higher risks of dying from multiple causes. In my clinic, I see a 45-year-old black man on Medicaid who lives in Oakland, I also see a similarly aged white man who has commercial insurance and lives in San Francisco. That black patient, due to his social determinants of health, has a higher risk of diabetes. And so you would think my diabetes prevention program might disproportionately benefit him. But in cost effectiveness assessments, traditionally, the quality of life benefit of my intervention and the length of life benefit of my intervention for that black patient is actually curtailed because that black man in Oakland has other competing risks of morbidity and mortality. He has a higher risk of dying from respiratory issues, cancers, homicide, than the equivalent white patient in San Francisco. And so the benefits of my intervention calculated for a more marginalized or disadvantaged group are actually calculated as particularly lower because most cost-effectiveness assessments assume those competing risks will never change. So let me just make sure I get this uh, before we go to the second one because they're each complicated. So the idea is you have an intervention that's potentially very effective but because the person you're giving it to may have a greater risk of dying of something completely unrelated, in the cost-effective analysis, the extra years they're going to get, even though your intervention is really terrific, uh, are suppressed. And so when you're doing the math, because these are all sort of computations, it looks like it's not as beneficial as it really is from a clinical perspective. Is that the right way to think about it? That is the right way to think about it, and it's because the typical analysis assumes there's fewer years left to benefit from preventing the disease of interest. Okay, that's really interesting. So let's go to the second reason. The second reason is a bit less complicated, especially for practitioners in uh, clinical practice to understand, and it's because of lower baseline healthcare costs among disadvantaged groups. So disadvantaged groups often have less healthcare expenditures, even if they have the same conditions, because of lack of insurance or lower paying insurance like Medicaid. So if my patient in Oakland goes to the public hospital, Highland Hospital, and uh, gets dialysis, the Medicaid program will spend net health dollars that are lower than if my white patient in San Francisco goes to um a Sutter Health Facility, where the dialysis costs more. Now, if I am then preventing dialysis with my program, disproportionately among the black men in Oakland who get lower, who generate lower healthcare costs from their dialysis, my program is actually saving less money than if I am preventing complications among populations who may have, for example, commercial health insurance even though the health benefits are the same or even greater. So I like how you sort of finish with that. The idea is in a cost effectiveness analysis, the health benefits are translated into dollars and the, the conversion factor, if you will, from health to dollars depends on uh, who's paying. It also probably depends on things like access barriers. If people are under uh, utilizing um, because of, uh, barriers to getting care, they're also probably, you're probably saving less money in a lot of different ways. Correct. And, uh, you know, several papers have quantified that particularly marginalized populations have less access to centers that may be tertiary care centers and in turn are also more expensive at baseline. 
And so there's sort of less dollars to save from improving their health in these types of analyses. Okay, so let's go to the third way this can happen. So the third way that we can see inadvertent perpetuation of disparities in cost-effectiveness analysis is by incorporating indirect costs like lost work productivity because of wage disparities. So interventions that prevent lost work time may appear to have lower economic benefits, for example, for women versus men due to existing wage disparities. This can make the intervention seem less cost-benefiting for populations whose work is valued less in absolute wage terms, even if the health benefits are equal or greater for them. So if I'm going to put these together, uh, we've done a lot around racism in health affairs, and these are all structural issues. I just want to be clear about this. This isn't people are taking a biased approach in their assessments. They're not intentionally seeking to devalue one person relative to another. What you're describing are structural dimensions of traditional cost effectiveness that will bake in existing disparities and therefore reveal results that perpetuate those disparities. That is that, am I getting that right? I think so. This is essentially arguing that the calculation methods we have today assume the status quo in a way that may accidentally perpetuate health disparities because they inform decisions that in turn may reinforce existing structural inequalities. Okay, well, I feel like, and I hope our listeners would agree, I feel like I have a good sense. These all make sense to me. I don't know exactly the scale of them, but certainly the direction of them uh, points all in one way, which is that those who have historically and currently are uh, disadvantaged or excluded, um, that the the algebra used in the assessment is going to show uh, lower benefits even when we address uh, their health needs. And that, that, that certainly would be, uh, uh, as you say in the title of the paper, perpetuating the disparities that exist. Um, we'll turn our attention now to what to do about this, because again, even though cost effectiveness has its ups and downs, it's still conceptually an important tool. So we'll talk about what we might do about this and, and what the implications of that are. We'll have that conversation after we take a short break. And we're back. I'm speaking with Dr. Sanjay Basu about the risk of perpetuating health disparities through using traditional cost effectiveness assessment mechanisms. Uh, Thus far, we've really focused on how these disparities can be perpetuated. But thankfully, you and your co-authors also gave some thought to ways you could try to address these these risks of, of of uh, coming up with results that that perpetuate disparities. Now, you refer to them in the paper as technical fixes, and I don't want to get super technical here, but you did such a nice job of explaining the sources of bias. I'm going to ask you to try to do a similarly great job in describing the approach you might take to uh, reduce the likelihood that these will be the outcomes of cost-effectiveness assessments. Sure, thank you. We propose a few different approaches to improve cost-effectiveness analysis methods. The first is to conduct analyses that don't assume that current health disparities will persist indefinitely. This allows us to consider scenarios where inequalities are reduced over time. For example, if my patient in Oakland were not to face uh, different competing risks of gun violence, how much might that indirectly affect my calculation of benefits of diabetes prevention? Uh, The second is to explore calculation methods that place higher value on health gains for disadvantaged groups, recognizing greater marginal benefit of health improvements for these populations. Uh, What, in other words, is beneficial for someone who has $100 
multiple causes for high morbidity and mortality earlier in life versus for someone who might have incremental benefits later. And really broadening our analytic lens to account for how interventions might affect multiple health risks simultaneously rather than focusing on a single disease in isolation. We've seen, for instance, interventions that affect food insecurity have indirect effects by helping people purchase food more cheaply, they have more money to spend on medication co-pays for a variety of chronic ailments. And so there are indirect benefits to quantify. So I'm not going to try to walk through those all in complete detail, but they basically, as I listen to you, they describe uh, efforts to reverse or uh, somehow take into account the kinds of, of biases that can exist in traditional methods. Um, now, this is an analysis that you're presenting to us, and I guess I want to ask the question, um, is this enough? Like, if we do the things you describe, would we feel confident that cost-effectiveness assessments can be used without the risk of perpetuating disparities? Or, I mean, how, how would I think about whether the fixes are, are enough? I think... While these improvements are a step in the right direction, they're unlikely to be enough to solve the problems we're highlighting. The problems we're highlighting are related to perpetuating assumptions about the way in which we quantify health and cost. And so while we have technical fixes that we suggest about improving cost-effectiveness analysis, I think that's just one part of a broader effort needed to make a substantial improvement in how we value and prioritize interventions that benefit particularly disadvantaged populations and help ensure that our analytic tools promote equity rather than hinder it. And there are ethical questions, political questions, um, critical questions about how we develop the theory around economic assessment that I think we would need to have so that it's not just a technical fix to one particular method that's seen as sufficient. Yeah, that seems particularly relevant to the second fix that you described, because in essence, that one was about uh, elevating the value of reducing disparities or elevating the value of solving health challenges for people who have uh, who bear the greater burden. And that, that really is a value statement. Um, it's one that I think you have to embrace if you want equity, but, uh, but if, uh, converting that value statement into a mathematical formula that would actually alter the outcome of a cost effectiveness assessment, that sounds like a pretty complicated undertaking. Correct. For many years, particularly in the eighties, health economics pretended to hide behind the veneer of technocracy. The hand of the market would decide the mathematical formula, and then what would follow would be an apolitical, uh, almost physics-like manifestation of truth. I think it's been widely accepted that the embedded assumptions of how we construct our formulas are themselves informed by who is constructing them, what their values are, how they've thought through the assumptions of what they value and what they do and do do not consider in the calculations. And so it is a harder conversation, uh, not a purely technical fix that we're calling for in order to really address um, the issues related to how we value different interventions. Well, that makes uh, sense to me. So let me just uh, flip to the other side. If, If we don't fix these problems, sort of what what are we left with? What, what's the risk uh, if we just sort of say, well, yeah, these are tough, uh, tough problems, but we've always known there are challenges with cost effectiveness. Let's just sort of leave well enough alone. Mm-hmm. I think if we fail to make these improvements, we risk perpetuating and potentially exacerbating the existing health disparities. If we systematically undervalue interventions that benefit disadvantaged group, we might misallocate the resources away from those, and that could significantly, you know, affect health outcomes for marginalized populations. As an example, uh, where my clinic is in San Francisco, there's a neighborhood called the Bayview. A cost-effectiveness assessment was conducted there in this largely African-American population where there is a former Navy yard uh, 
um, that has a lot of environmental pollution associated with it. The intervention in question was some sustainable housing, and it was found that the cost effectiveness was not favorable in part because of competing risks associated with the flight and morbidity and mortality in environmental terms from respiratory disease, cancers, and the so, so forth in the neighborhood. And when we did a sensitivity analysis around that assessment, we found that the results were highly sensitive to whether or not uh, sufficient cleanup and related environmental health interventions would take place in the neighborhood or not. And so these are deeply tied to city in this case or county, state, federal policy decisions around what to fund and what not to. Well, uh, it, I appreciate you giving this a real-world example because these do come into play. And the thought that we would make major resource allocation decisions, and in this instance, it sounds like decline to make a potentially significantly health-improving investment because of, uh, of a cost-effectiveness assessment that, as we've discussed, sort of bakes in pre-existing uh, uh, disparities is that that's that's pretty uh, that's pretty scary to contemplate, but but it happens all the time. So as we come to a close, I, I guess I want to situate uh, this analysis that you've done and uh, critique, if I could say, of traditional cost effectiveness analysis into the broader discourse around cost effectiveness and cost effectiveness analyses around uh, uh, using these quantitative tools. You already earlier mentioned that, you know, most analysts would say, don't just use thresholds, that's too rough a cut. But can you just, uh, since you've given a lot of thought to this in its context, I just wonder if you could say a little more about the broader role of cost effectiveness and whether this, uh, uh, you think, sort of shakes the underpinnings even more or provides us potentially with a positive way out or, or maybe some of each. I think there are some broader implications that provide both um, some critique, but also some hope. One is that we have the opportunity to critically examine the assumptions built into our analytic tools and how sensitive the results are to seemingly neutral methods that can incorporate and perpetuate existing disparities. There is a greater need for transparency in how the analyses are conducted, how they might differentially impact various population groups and not hide behind the math as a barrier to discussing what assumptions are built in. And I think we have the opportunity to consider adopting a more holistic approach to evaluating interventions that takes into account broader societal impact and long-term effects on health equity uh, that may be difficult to quantify in purely dollar terms. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate uh, the importance of just doing this kind of thinking, even if it doesn't lead automatically to a simple conclusion about what to do. It reminds us, as you say, that uh, economic methods have hidden for years. You said this better than I will, but they've they sort of hidden behind a, a, a veneer or a, a, a claim of neutrality. And what you're really pushing us to do is to to uh, interrogate that. And um, when you do, it turns out, as with many things, that there are values baked in that uh, some people would sort of rather pretend aren't there. But you've brought that to light. And uh, at least that's the beginning of a conversation that needs to happen. Uh, where it leads is another matter. But um, without analyses like yours, we probably wouldn't have the conversation at all. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for your interest in having me here. Well, it's been great having you as my guest today on Health Policy. Thanks again for the work and the conversation. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll tell a friend about the Health Policy.